Good. Elizabeth, do, do, do please share with us whatever thoughts you have. May I say that Elizabeth Theokritov, uh, Orthodox theologian, is, I mean, well, somebody I've, I mean, uh, whose writing I've always admired, um, associated with the uh, um, Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge. Um, and, I mean, I couldn't think of anybody better uh, to give the final word for the, for the conference. Well, thank you. I'm not sure about that, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I greet all of you, Christoph Anesti, Christ is risen. Mm. I see that some of the misgivings I had about talking about spiritual life and things spiritual in the context of tourism has already been addressed by others just in the last hour or so that I've listened to because promoting a more conscious way of life is clearly a very important and timely theme. It also seemed to me somewhat ironic in the context of tourism because that brings to my mind at least primarily mass commercial tourism for holiday makers who want a change of scene, a time to forget any need to change themselves or the way they live. And that sort of tourism is the absolute antithesis of a more conscious way of life. Mercifully, however, we may hope that the recognition of the climate crisis is actually going to put an end to this, what I would call mindless, mindless mass foreign tourism, along with the scandalously cheap flights that fuel it. So, when, sorry, I'm having difficulty getting this off the screen. So when people do travel, they may stay for longer, and importantly, they will probably give much more serious, serious thought to the places they choose to be in for that time, rather than, you know, a hotel that could be anywhere so long as it's got sun and sand and the flights are cheap. Greece is superbly placed, actually, to offer this something more, this something profound and, indeed, life-changing, to foreign visitors and spiritual seekers, if only it would recognize it. I, I can say that you know, visiting Greece was life-changing to, to me when I first came, and I'm not the only one. And today's discussion of religious tourism, uh, monasteries and holy places uh, in relation to Greece is, I hope, a real sign of the country throwing off, of two, throwing off 200 plus years of what's really a, a foreign imposed fantasy of what the essence of Greece is, one that equates Greece with its ancient history and seems to consider 2,000 years of Christian Hellenic culture as some sort of irrelevance or even something of an embarrassment. I think that this desperately needs to be rethought and I hope is being in the wake of the pandemic and the lockdown, let alone the environmental crisis, people are suddenly discovering the importance of the rhythms of everyday life and of valuing the place where one is. Now, traveling abroad to learn how to do this uh, might seem quite counterintuitive, but in fact, visiting and, and spending time in a place where a more integrated way of living survives more than it does, uh, for instance, in most parts of England, this can help us return home and see our surroundings and our life with new eyes. That sort of integration of life was certainly true of Greece, principally in the less touristic areas. A generation or so ago, how much it is still, I don't know, but certainly something of the memory remains in the land the French Orthodox writer Olivier Clément speaks of nature in what he calls the old Christian lands, thinking primarily of Western Europe, um, but he, you know, it applies equally to Orthodox countries, bearing the marks of grace almost as if it had a face. And the building and land use in these countries exhibiting what he calls a mastery that does not obliterate but releases prayer from things. And I think this, this is an experience that people have. I think of the, all those little wayside shrines with 
you know, a few candles lit or unlit, an, an icon, some tamata, and isolated chapels in rural Greece. Or indeed, I always remember how struck I was years and years ago visiting the village of Aigitheca in eastern Crete. And there were the, the sarcophagi of the, the martyrs just behind the village church. There is a real sense that holiness seeps into the very earth where saints, known or unknown, have lived and died. But those, this doesn't have to be a sort of archaeological or folkloric recovery. Those who want to recover a more integrated life can look above all to the monasteries. And Costa sort of us has already referred to them and indeed to some of those that I would also highlight. Because the 20th century revival in Greek monasticism, uh, apart from the Holy Mountain, uh, particularly women's monasticism, is, if not the country's best kept secret, then certainly not nearly as well known among spiritual seekers as it deserves to be. On this front, uh, a breakthrough of sorts is represented by the books of Kyriakos Markidis. Those who don't know them, I would highly recommend go out and find them. Mountain of Silence and uh, several other subsequent titles. Uh, they're published in the United States, and they are also translated it into Greek, most of them. The, and the author conveys graphically and engagingly his, his own excitement at discovering in the Orthodox Christian tradition in which he was brought up, the spiritual teaching and the profundity of the ascetic way that he'd spent years wandering about looking for in Eastern religions and spiritualities. And I think many others have followed the same tra trajectory. Not all of them rediscover this tradition in Christianity, because it's not only Orthodox. I mean, there are so many Western Christians who just have no idea there's anything like this in the Christian tradition. And it's something very much con connected with an, an ecological way of living, um, you know, a, a, a way of relating to and using the material world. But typically, the, the contemporary monastic communities that have reappropriated this spiritual tradition with, in all its vitality are also prime examples of this integrated life that is practical and viable. It has to be, you know, monastic communities have to live, uh, as well as profoundly spiritually nourishing This is, it's a life attuned to the rhythms of the church year and the natural seasons, and also where the treatment of all material things is governed by an asceticism, a restraint, and therefore a respect. And that's whether it's wild nature, farm animals, farm produce, building materials and buildings, or indeed recycled items that may be painful, painstakingly reclaimed for use so that they don't go to waste, so that the the materials and the craftsmanship that have go in, gone into them can once more glorify God and serve human beings. And simply the, 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 the combination of beauty and utility is something very moving and, and something very satisfying and that so many people want to reclaim in their own lives. Prime examples that come to mind, again, that uh, Mr. Zorbas has mentioned, Chrysopihi Monastery, right there in Fania, uh, Timir Kodromo, and Aya in the Bolos Diocese, and there are many more. And clearly, experiencing places like this is, you know, it, it does have to be experienced, and it, it cannot be sort of packaged as a tourist experience something you go and take photos of and go home. It, it, it has to change you. But in addition to private visits, you know, other possibilities, I mean, much more could be done along the lines of spiritual ecology camps, which have been organized uh, on Mount Athos through the Friends of Mount Athos organization uh, for well over 20, well, more than 20 years now. 
uh, taking groups of young people in that case to experience to you know, work in the community and experience the life of the community and precisely that integrated life. Uh, Timio Kavaramo, which has an, an extensive uh, organic farm and a, a lot of the things that they grow are, are grown for their heritage crop varieties of crops grown for seeds. And they already participate in the, what they call it, the WOOF scheme, the willing workers on organic farms. And this is a way for people whose primary interest is environmental, but who can say where it will lead them in terms of spiritual life, but without putting pressure on them to participate in more than they want to of the monastic life. Uh, I... I will finish here, and uh, I hope in the discussion there will be more to say along these lines. So thank you very much indeed. indeed.